Mm, yeah. I will check if they need something. Great. It's already recording. Just, uh, and they're starting to come. People are starting to come, right? Okay. <laughs> I mean, this morning I was participating. There is a the high latitude dust meeting. Yes. So yes. And today I was I was I was this morning participating too. Yes. A lot of dust. Yeah. Well, not as much as in West Africa. <laughs> oh yeah, no, no, it's, it's a lot of. No, it's a stupid uh, a joke. Of dust, uh, <laughs> seminars. I mean, yesterday today I'm. You know, by by ten o'clock here, I'm already exhausted of seeing so many seminars. <laughs> Yes. I mean, it's it's, it's nine o'clock here. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think we're going to, I'm not seeing now the participant list. Uh, um, yes. So we're welcoming participants. We're going to wait for an additional minute um, and then we will start. Um, okay. Okay, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to start uh, by introducing our our speaker today, uh, Beatriz uh, Morena. Uh, so thanks, Beatriz, for 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 being with us. Uh, Beatriz is a senior scientist at uh, CNRS, and uh, her field of research is modeling of mineral dust emissions and the uh, mineral dust cycle. Um, she has been in charge of the mineral dust cycle research group at LISA since 2007. And she's now deputy director of LISA uh, since 2020. Uh, she's uh, super recognized in our field, working since a long time ago on it and involved in many different field campaigns and, and um, initiatives related to, to dust. And so we're very happy to, to have her here today to give a presentation. So Beatrice, the floor uh, is yours uh, and uh, you have 40 minutes and then we will have time for questions. So I just would say that Anybody who has a question, please write it over the, the, the Q&A, um, not through the chat, just the Q&A, if possible. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much uh, for this very nice uh, introduction. I need to share my screen, I guess, with the presentation. So I hope yes. you can see it and try to... Is it okay for you? Yes, full screen now. Exactly. Perfect. Okay, so I wanted to associate uh, all my uh, colleagues in France and in African countries that contribute to the uh, monitoring of uh, dirt I I'm going to talk about. And I add a subtitle to my presentation, which is from AMA to INDAF. So one uh, old research program where we started this monitoring to the INDAF, which is the actual uh, status of our Monitoring, monitoring station. So when we started this uh, monitoring, the basic question so was why to monitor uh, dust in West Africa? Uh, so simply because Sarah and Cell uh, are the largest arid and semi-arid region in the world. And we knew that it was uh, the place where the highest atmospheric dust load was measured, both inland and also downwind of the, of the Sahara. So this is due to the fact that uh, the annual emissions uh, where of, of the dust uh, were assumed to originate from this re region as uh, recently confirmed by uh, Koch et al. Uh, the question also uh, we had concerning mineral dust in the cell was the fact that there is a dependence uh, between the dust content there uh, and climate conditions and a link also with vegetation. And this was shown by different uh, record from synoptic station. The one here corresponding to the precipitation deficit uh, recorded at the station of Nouakchott in Mauritania. So this corresponds to the gray bars. And uh, you can see that uh, uh, from the 60s to the year 20, uh, uh, 2000, uh, the cell has experienced uh, severe droughts in the 70s and in the 80s. And during the same time, uh, there was a very strong increase of the number of local erosion events. So uh, this uh, significant increase it it was remarkable. And also what was surprising is that after the drought, uh, the wind erosion remains higher than it was before. 
either because of general climate was not exactly the same or also because of uh, change in vegetation or change in land use. Land use also have a, an impact on wind erosion and that was uh, demonstrated very early in 2001 and illustrated here by this uh, figure that shows the accumulated wind erosion flux measured at the surface on a cultivated field and on the fallow in Niger. And you clearly show that significant erosion is measured only on the cultivated field. And this is because of the fields are maintained bare uh, before the wet season, and they are submitted very strong wind associated with convective systems. So with this uh, basic uh, knowledge, uh, we were involved in a uh, huge uh, international programs called the AMA, Interdiscipli AMA Monsoon Interdisciplinary Analysis that include uh, intensive period experiments, but also uh, what was called the extent extended observing period and the idea was to monitor uh, dust during three years uh, and the first objective was to simply quantify the dust contents in the cell and try and understand uh, what makes the dust content vary from the daily to the senior seasonal and interannual time scale and at this period of time we had a strategy and the idea was to obtain a consistent data set that could help to constrain the dust mass budget at the regional scale. So we decided to uh, deploy a monitoring that includes uh, information on the vertically integrated amount of dust, which correspond to the aerosol optical depths, the surface concentration, and also the total and the wet deposition flux. So we uh, deployed this monitoring over three stations uh, in Niger, Mali and Senegal that was uh, located along the main pathway of the Saharan dust toward the Atl Atlantic Ocean and more or less uh, at the same uh, precipitation level. So this was the so-called Sahelian dust transect. And the station in uh, Senegal was finally moved uh, inland uh, in uh, 2013 and is still working now. So at this station that were uh, located in remote places, uh, we had to select instrumentation that were simple and sufficiently resistant to very severe conditions in terms of dust amount and temperature. So we decided to deploy uh, monitoring of the dust uh, concentration uh, with a selection in size, with a, an inlet that allows to collect particulate matter smaller than 10 micron, and the concentration is measured by the instrument, uh, the TM, which is a, a sort of balance that measures the mass of uh, dust particle in the air. We monitor the total deposition and the wet deposition with the two devices that you can see here. On this station, we also have a sun photometer from the Aeronet network, and we also decided to monitor the surface metrology, so basing parameters like wind speed, direction, temp air temperature, and relative humidity with a very high um, time resolution compared to synoptic stations. So we didn't uh, monitor size, uh, dust size distribution uh, because at this period it was uh, too complex to find the right instrument and to deploy such in instrumentation. And our analysis was that uh, by measuring these three parameters, optical depth, PN10 concentration and deposition, we will get uh, indirect information on the dust size distribution. So that's uh, what is illustrated on this graph where you see in black the size distribution of uh, some dust emit simulated by the sun blasting model from uh, Stefan Alfaro. So you have two extreme si situation with mainly uh, a micronic modes and another situation with a coarse uh, mode uh, emitted uh, sim simulated by the emission model. And you have the limit of 10 micron. I also plot the extinction coefficient uh, corresponding to typical uh, optical uh, properties of dust. So you can uh, see that the optical dust will mainly be uh, sensitive to the submicronic uh, dust, that the PM10 concentration will be mainly uh, uh, um, affected by the micronic particles, while deposition was expected to um, be mainly driven by uh, particles larger than 10 microns. So 
By combining these three parameters, we expected to have information on dust size. So the first thing we investigated with this monitoring was a seasonal cycle. So in the cell, uh, it is well known that you have a very uh, contrasted situation with two seasons, uh, a dry season in the winter corresponding to the armaton flow. And the two seasons are modulated by the, the displacement uh, of the intertropical convergence zone. So when the, con the convergence zone moves to the north, the monsoon flow uh, um, move into the cell. And then we have the wet season, which is hot, moist, and uh, correspond also to the season with precipitation. So this is exactly what we record with our uh, meteorological measurements. So in red, you have the temperature, the water vapor content, and the precipitation. So we clearly see the uh, precipitation uh, corresponding to the wet season. And you also see when looking at the uh, air humidity, uh, the, the, the succession of the Armaton dry season and the wet uh, monsoon season. So we are clearly in this uh, success, succession of season uh, in our stations. So then we examined the dust concentration that were measured there for the first time. So here you have the daily mean concentration measured in uh, Mali, in Sinzana. So the first uh, information that is that they vary by two to three orders of magnitude uh, during the year. And that uh, in average, the concentration are maximum in the spring. And we have a minimum of concentration in summer, uh, which correspond to the maximum of precipitation. So we have this very nice uh, seasonal cycle, uh, but that are not exactly phased with the two climatological uh, seasons, which correspond to the Armaton and the monsoon. When we look at the wind that is supposed to drive the dust emission and dust uh, concentration, uh, we uh, have once again the succession of Armaton and monsoon season that can be traced uh, by the wind direction. But we also found that the maximum uh, wind velocity was uh, recorded at the beginning of the summer and uh, minimum in autumn, which is once again not strictly phased with the success succession of the uh, monsoon and Armaton, and also uh, we found that the winds were not phased with the dust concentration. So to understand uh, this uh, difference in the seasonal cycle, uh, we compared the daily mean concentration that I showed you previously to the frequency of wind higher than a certain threshold that correspond to the threshold for wind erosion and local dust production. So we uh, clearly see that we have a, a significant frequency of wind higher than the threshold at the beginning of the wet season, and that can be associated to very high uh, concentration. But so this corresponds to local dust emission at the beginning of the wet season, but that in the spring, we have no local dust emission, and these high concentrations are mainly due to siren dust transport to the cell. So in terms of seasonal cycle, uh, from this uh, first analysis, uh, we uh, saw that in the dry season, we mainly have siren dust transport that is responsible for the highest uh, average seasonal and monthly concentration, and that we detect local dust emission in the wet season with extremely high uh, daily uh, dust concentration. So we wanted to go further in examining this dust emission in the wet season, and uh, I show you here the kind of record uh, we can get for such events. So you have the five minute uh, PM10 concentration in red and the surface wind velocity in uh, green. So uh, we uh, observe that when um, we have such events, the dust concentration can increase by two orders of magnitude in a very short time uh, step. And that the dust concentration and wind velocity increase simultaneously. So this is highlighted in this picture uh, where the dust concentration has uh, been, the surface wind have been plotted as a function of the concentration. So we can see that during this uh, convective situation, we have a nice relationship between the wind and the concentration, which is not the case outside of this period of conditions. So we uh, interpret this relationship as the sign of uh, local dust emissions that are due to the very high winds that are associated with uh, mesoscale convective systems uh, passing in the cell. To give you an idea of uh, 
what uh, these curves correspond to. You have here a picture where you see this massive dust wall uh, arriving on you. So that's exactly what we record uh, with the increase of the concentration in a very uh, short time scale. So if we extend the analysis on a longer, much longer time scale, so here, uh, the dust concentration measured between 2006 and 2016, we uh, clearly see again this relationship between the concentration and uh, the maximum wind speed recorded during these events. We have quite nice relationship when we look uh, at the beginning of the wet season, May, June, and progressively we, let's say, lose uh, this correlation uh, and we interpret uh, this uh, shift in the relation due to the increase of the erosion threshold because while precipitation occurs, vegetation develops and is able to inhibit dust emission. So to further evaluate the impact of the vegetation, uh, we have uh, analyzed the PM10 concentration and the way the concentration can be distribution distributed as a function of the wind and uh, looking at this distribution for different uh, vegetation cover that have been here quantified use, using a satellite index, which is quite well known, the NDVI. So on each curve uh, in Niger, Banizumbu, and in Mali, Senzana, you have the PM10 concentration associated with the different wind speed classes for different conditions of vegetation. So you can clearly see that for each wind class, you have a much lower concentration where the NDVI is high than when the NDVI uh, gives low vegetation cover. So it shows that the dust concentration are significantly lowered uh, by the presence of vegetation and the lowering can be up to 80% because the vegetation develops during the wet season. What you can also see is that uh, you don't have much uh, situation with very high winds corresponding to high and DVIs. And this is due to the fact that once uh, we progress in the seasons, the wind associated with convection uh, is lower at the period where vegetation develops. So finally, uh, we observe that dust emission decrease all along the wet season due to the wind, uh, to the fact that the wind speed associated with uh, convective activity uh, tend to decrease, and also because the vegetation develops and increase the erosion threshold, which inhibits local dust emissions. We also wanted to examine uh, the question of the seasonality of the dust emissions uh, all along the year. And to do that, uh, we examine another uh, indicators, which is a potential wind erosion. Uh, that is characterized by what is called the dust uplift potentials. You, you have the equation of the slides. So we computed this uh, dupe uh, for uh, our salient station using our five minutes uh, wind velocity measurements. And we had the opportunity to compare this uh, computed uh, dupe with uh, in situ measurements of horizontal uh, sediment flux measured with sand catchers in Banizumbu and during a long period. So when we compare the cumulated uh, dupe with the cumulated flux, we clearly see that we have with this dupe a very good proxy of the dynamic of the wind uh, that can be recorded uh, over a bare surface. So, which gives you an indication of the maximum wind erosion you can obtain for a given wind regime, assuming a bare and totally erodible surface. So, because we have these long-term meteorological measurements, we were able to examine the variability of this uh, dupe, and especially to examine the question of the duration of the erosion uh, events in the cell. So, on this slide, you can see the number of wind speed events as a function of their duration. And then you have the same uh, cumulative figure that corresponds to the cumulated dust uplift potential and the associated uh, duration. So with this uh, classification, uh, you can see that half of the periods where the wind are higher than the threshold for wind erosion have duration less than one hour. 
And uh, we have a, a similar result for the dupe, uh, where uh, we can see that most of the events producing significant dupe have duration less than a few hours, both in Banizumu and Sinzana. So you, you clearly see that the wind erosion potential is associated with very short duration events and that you cannot uh, properly estimate this uh, uh, wind erosion potential uh, if you don't have a, a right uh, time resolution sampling for wind velocity. If we examine the diurnal cycle of this uh, wind speed, so this is what it's plotted here. So on the upper line, you have the number of uh, wind speed rec of recorded wind speed higher than five, seven meter per second, which is more or less a minimum erosion threshold uh, in the dry season and in wet season. In the middle, you have say you have the distribution for let's say high winds that may contribute significantly to the dust uplift potential, and on the bottom line, you have the dust uplift potential in the dry season and in the wet season. So you can uh, see that uh, in, the, in the dry season, uh, the winds higher than the threshold are recording mainly in the morning. And these high winds are mainly uh, are due uh, to the, the descent and the mixing of the nocturnal low level jets uh, that uh, descend to the surface and cause these high surface winds. And this is the only process that can uh, produce dust emission at this period of the year. And in the wet season, we uh, still have this uh, low level jet appearing on the wind distribution, but we also see very high winds, which are associated with the mesoscale convective system. And the dupe in the main season is mainly driven by these convective winds and not so much by the low level jet. This is uh, consistent with the diurnal cycle of the PM10 concentration uh, that is shown here for Banizumbu. So we have plotted here uh, a normalized uh, diurnal cycle uh, to, to, um, to not be impacted by the difference in the average intensity of the dust concentration between the two seasons. But we see that when we normalize uh, the diurnal cycle, we, we have uh, uh, the same diurnal cycle during the dry season with this maximum corresponding to the uh, low level jet. And in the wet season, we mainly record a very high concentration during the evening and the nights, so which are clearly associated with the local emission by uh, convection in the wet season. Because of this uh, recording, we also uh, were, we were we have been able to examine the role of the precipitation yeah, on the wind erosion. So what is uh, shown here is a wind uh, speed distribution associated with a different uh, fraction of precipitation recorded on the two sides. So uh, red corresponds to the first 20% of the cumulated rain and green 20 to 40 and so on. So this allowed to examine the wind distribution uh, without accounting for the vari variability of the amount of precipitation. So we clearly see on this distribution that the highest wind are recorded at the beginning of the wet season and that the intensity of the wind decreased during the wet season. So the highest wind are recorded at the period where we don't have so much rain. As a result, uh, when we quantify the impact of precipitation on the dust uplift potential. So this is what it's illustrated here. So you have the average dust uplift potential month by month in Niger and in Mali. And uh, you have the part of the dust uplift potential that can be inhibited by the rain in blue uh, that can be substrated. And this uh, inhibition is uh, in average 26% in Niger, 25 in Mali. So finally, the impact of precipitation is significant, but it's not the major driver of the seasonal, uh, of, se of the seasonality of the dust emission due to convection. So in terms of seasonality, uh, first, we have found that this uh, dust uplift potential can be a good proxy of the local uh, potential wind erosion. Uh, but because we are able to compute it with the relevant uh, time resolution, we found that the low 
level jet and the convective system both produce significant dust uplift potential, but in the station of Niger and Mali, uh, convection largely uh, contribute to the dust uplift potential compared to the low level jet. We also uh, found that precipitation affects wind erosion, but it's not the major factor that uh, in particular explain the decrease of the erosion during the wet season, uh, which is mainly uh, driven by the change in the wind speed during the wet season. We also monitor the dust deposition. So uh, we have two kinds of measurements for deposition. We use a, a total passive collector, which is called an inverted frisbee because of this shape, and is full with marble to avoid the remobilization of the dust deposited in the dry season, also, also some loss due to intense rainfall. And we also have a wet deposition uh, collector. Uh, as you can see on the picture, there is a rain detector that allows uh, the cover of the bu bucket to shift on the other bucket so that we can collect only wet deposition with this sampler. So the, sam the dust is collected with a large amount of water uh, that is uh, decanted, drying, awaiting. And from these measurements, we get the total and the wet uh, deposition flux, but only the insoluble fraction because we collect it with water. So on this figure, we have the annual uh, mean deposition flux measured at the three stations in Niger, Mali, and Senegal that are uh, plotted here in red, and that, ha that have been compared to data uh, of annual deposition or uh, deposition during the dry season from the literature. So we see that uh, our data, hopefully, are consistent with the data we found in the literature, which are not so numerous. And we clearly see from this picture that deposition flux, which are quite high uh, in the Sahara and Sahelian region, decrease very rapidly from the sources to the transport region. And this is true in all direction of transport toward the Mediterranean Sea toward the Atlantic Ocean and also downwind in the Gulf of Guinea. When we look at the seasonal cycle of this uh, deposition uh, as plotted here, so deposition flux are the bars, the red bars, and the wet deposition is highlighted by the blue section. And we compared the seasonal cycle of the uh, deposited flux to the concentration in orange and the precipitation in blue. So uh, you can see, uh, as already explained, that the maximum concentration is are recorded uh, in March. The precipitation are uh, maximum in August, which corresponds to the minimum of the concentration. But deposition maximum is just in between, uh, between the maximum of concentration and the maximum of precipitation. Because to have deposition, you need to have significant concentration and precipitation occurrence. If we compare the situation at the three stations, so in the middle, uh, you have the station I, I, I showed you on the previous slides. Uh, so in this station, wet deposition uh, is a major uh, process for deposition, since it represents in average 65% uh, of total deposition. In uh, in Niger, uh, in the station in Niger, we have higher uh, dust concentration, but lower precipitation than in Mali. But deposition, wet deposition is uh, still uh, a major uh, contributor, to, contributor to deposition, since it represents, in average, 52% uh, of total deposition. In Senegal, we have lower uh, dust concentration, lower precipitation, but as you can see, uh, precipitation does not occur at the same time, and they are not associated with uh, convective events, as we observed in Banizungu and Sinzana. So finally, uh, wet deposition only represents 8% of the total deposition in, the, in this station in Senegal. So concerning wet deposition, we found annual deposition in the cell of the order of 100 of gram per cubic meter. Uh, in Niger and in Senegal, wet deposition is really the main uh, contribution to total deposition, but it's really um, a minor fraction of deposition in Senegal. 
We also find that the timing of the precipitation compared to the occurrence of the dust is really a major factor of variability. The way you are able to match dust concentration and precipitation is really a key factor, both at the scale of an event, but also at the seasonal uh, at the seasonal scale. We also observe in our station that the highest deposition flux are mainly due to wet deposition and they are mainly related to the combination of very high concentration by local dust emission and the precipitation that are brought by the same convective system that produce these dust emissions. So because of this link uh, between convection and deposition, we uh, we have tried to investigate a little bit deeper what we can do about convection with this uh, uh, monitoring. And especially the, the, the question was, where are we able to, to detect and quantify these uh, situations? So we know that uh, convective systems are uh, associated uh, with cold pool. This is due to the fact that when uh, precipitation evaporate in the system, this creates a density current, which is characterized by an increase of the pressure, an increase of the wind speed, a decrease of temperature. That produces both this dust gust front that lead to dust emission, but that can also uh, lead to wet deposition. So the question was to evaluate the impact on this uh, on dust deposition. So first of all, we have uh, tried to detect uh, this cold pool and gust fronts uh, from our uh, dust monitoring. So we use as an indicator of the occurrence of convection, the fact that we record precipitation uh, and precipitation higher than uh, the detection limit of our instruments. And for each precipitation event, we have computed the change in temperature, wind speed and humidity. Uh, 90 minutes before and after we record a precipitation. And during this period of time, we also uh, re um, detect the maximum uh, recorded wind speed. So with this uh, treatment, we have been able to examine the relationship between the wind and the temperature in this uh, during this precipitation event. So when analyzing the data uh, during 10 years, we have 4032 precipitation events in Niger, more than 100, uh, 500 events in uh, Mali. And the plots show you uh, as a function of the change in temperature associated with this precipitation event, the change in the wind uh, velocity in green and the maximum uh, recorded wind speed. So at the two station, uh, we have a sort of mixing line uh, starting from a, let's say, stratiform uh, situation with uh, not um, no change in temperature, no uh, significant uh, high winds, up to very convective uh, systems with a strong change in wind direction, very strong maximum winds that are responsible for the local dust emission. And this is what we see at the two station. So if we focus on this uh, kind of situation, we are able to uh, give the general characteristics of these cold pools. So here in average in Banizumbu, uh, we have a, 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 a change in the wind speed of about five meters per second during this, tip, this kind of events, an average decrease of the temperature of seven degrees, uh, very high precipitation rate. And we also um, see a, a huge change in the PM10 concentration that are of the order of 5,000 micrograms per cubic meter before uh, the precipitation starts and uh, concentration as low as 100 micrograms per cubic meter after the precipitation. So in uh, Niger, uh, the number of events associated with these cold pools represent 90% uh, of total precipitation, which is very consistent with what's known about precipitation in the cell that are uh, assumed to be mainly uh, of convective origin. But this uh, situation is also responsible for the majority of the wet deposition flux, so 65% in Niger, but about 80% in the Mali. Uh, 
So for this situation, uh, we also examine the link between the dust concentration uh, in the deposition and in the air. And this was done uh, by examining also the precipitation rates. And we found that if we focused on the precipitation with the most intense uh, precipitation rates, we have a very nice uh, relationship between the concentration in the rain and the concentration in the air. So from these relationships, ship, we were able uh, to estimate the so-called washout ratio, which corresponds to the ratio uh, of the concentration of a compound in the air compared to its concentration uh, in the rain and in the air. Sorry. So to compute this uh, washout ratio, uh, when computing the, this ratio, we also found that the behavior was different uh, for high dust concentration and lower dust concentration. So when the concentration uh, are very high, the washout ratio decreases as a function of the precipitation amount, which is uh, due to the dilution effect, which is uh, kind of classical behavior of this washout ratio. But we also found that when the concentration was very high, there is not much variation of this uh, washout ratio due to the fact that there is no aerosol uh, limitation for washout in this situation. So concerning the link between uh, convection and deposition, uh, we found that with uh, our kind of basic meteorological measurements, we were able to detect uh, cold pools and thus uh, the occurrence of convective systems. And we have been able with this, uh, with this uh, basic measurements to estimate washout ratio uh, that could be used uh, in model for uh, the simulation of dust deposition in convective rains. So as a conclusion, uh, the first conclusion is that if, uh, because we have uh, initially uh, carefully selected the kind of parameters we wanted to monitor, monitor and uh, the kind of monitoring that was uh, really uh, relevant in such conditions. Uh, we have now very long time series and we have brought robust and reliable information on many aspects of the dust cycle. I have to mention that this requires a lot of efforts and organization. Uh, and especially I wanted to mention that we are not, uh, we have not been able to go uh, at the station in Mali since 2009 and uh, more recently in Niger, and that's because we have very uh, good local operators that uh, the measurements still take place. So we have a unique data set on dust concentration, aerosol optical depths, wet deposition, and meteorological conditions from 2006 up to now. And this is uh, something that we continue because we now have now have a, a national status of uh, observatory. Uh, we have merged our station with a station dedicated to uh, to the composition of precipitation and the composition of aerosol uh, to constitute this uh, national INDAF uh, network that is uh, based on uh, eight stations in seven countries with uh, three super sites where we have uh, the kind of measurements I show, but also additional information on the, uh, the composition of aerosol and precipitation. And this network also is part of the French uh, Research Infrastructure Actress. And you also have uh, the website where you can see all the information and download data if you're interested. Uh, in terms of scientific uh, conclusion, I will not say again what I've already uh, said, but we have examined the concentration, the position, and investigated their variability from the event to the seasonal and interannual time scale at the regional scale. And we found that the main dynamical drivers uh, to explain these features are the low level jet that plays a role in the dust emission, but also in dust transport all along the year in the cell. And we clearly uh, see that convection plays a major role, and not only for dust emission, but also for dust deposition. And because of this uh, critical role of convection, I think that uh, it's really a challenge for regional and, uh, and uh, global 3D models to, repre to uh, represent this kind of process. And this data set is really uh, an opportunity uh, to constrain the models on, on this respect. My uh, last slide is about ongoing uh, projects and challenging and challenges. Uh, from the data set, we have tried to detect any 
kind of trend and change and we didn't succeed. So one main um, challenge to maintain this uh, network is really to be able to detect any change in the wind and in the precipitation regime in this region and also uh, being able to detect any change in the dust concentration that could be related to land use or agri agricultural practice in the region. As I mentioned, we don't measure size distribution, which is really a key uh, uh, parameter uh, for understanding the, the mineral dust cycle. And uh, we have some ongoing project to try to locally examine the size distribution, especially in the deposition uh, samples. And we are also trying to uh, give additional information on the composition of dust uh, deposition, focusing on uh, nutrients that can be of interest for, for soil. So this is my last slide and I thank you very much for your attention and I am available for any question. Thank you so much, Beatrice. Uh, this is uh, impressive. Thank you so much. I mean, this is an amazing data set and amazing work you have done in the last years. Um, very valuable and I, I'm sure that it can be further exploited to to constrain models. Um, so Santiago, I give you the floor to for the uh, for the questions. I think we have a few questions already. Yeah, I see. Uh, uh, Paul has been very active, and, and uh, he dumped uh, <laughs> four questions already. I have my I have my questions too. Uh, uh, do, uh, Beatrice, do you want me to read the questions to you or? Or, uh, can, it's can it's really no. I can because I share my screen. I cannot see the okay. participant okay. or the. I cannot see anything except my slide and 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 some of you. Okay, I I read them. Uh, I read them for you. Uh, this is from Paul Gino. Uh, he's asking about uh, uh, if the network is still active and how to access the data. So the answer is there. <laughs> So yes, the network is uh, active, uh, and as I mentioned, is even more active than uh, what we were initially doing because uh, you can also have accept on, on access to information on aerosol composition and aerosol and chemistry of precipitation in some of these uh, stations, and you have the the website there, and that uh, ops MIP, and the data okay. are free, are freely distributed. That makes sense. Uh, he comments on precipitation, and actually, I was wondering the same question. The what is the do 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 you have an estimate of how much uh, after a rain event, how much does it take to dry up, and how uh, how long it takes to have a uh, you know dust dust activity to resume after a precipitation event. Uh, yes, there is a paper by Gilbert Gametti. I don't have, I don't think I have any slide about this, because this was uh, this was not done only using uh, this uh, monitoring data, but also because we had some uh, saltiphone. Uh, I don't know if you know the saltiphone is the same instrument than the Sensit. Mm -hmm. During the AMA project, during several years, we had this saltiphone in uh, in Banizumbu on the on the bare uh, fields. So we have been able to examine for all the erosion events, how long it takes to come back to, I would say the same kind of relationship between uh, saltation and wind uh, and wind velocity. And, and the main result is that after uh, 12 hours, you are sure to be back to the pre-precipitation situation. So depending on the amount of precipitation or, or the time in the season, it can be shorter, uh, but 12 years is really the maximum. But this is also because it's a very sandy uh, area, so you don't have so much uh, capability to retain the water in the soil, and also because it's really hot. So I, I'm not sure you can easily extrapolate to uh, any other part in the world. Uh, and oh, you, okay. but, but you can have the same kind of monitoring, which was not so difficult, like except that you have to maintain it to have a, a sufficient number of uh, saltation or erosion events. And once again, the, the time uh, resolution is, is critical because these are short duration events. Yeah. 
Yeah, 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 makes sense. Well, actually, the, the next question is kind of similar. Uh, Paul is wondering to what degree of what you see in, in these measurements, which are mostly representative of Sahel, I mean, to what degree it can be translated to uh, or re uh, replicated for Sahara events, more, you know, things that happen further north? To what degree what you see there is also happening in the Sahara? Well, I, I think that's a, the what is expected to change, uh, especially in terms of the relative role of the low level jet and convection or any other meteorological uh, process, is, yeah, is the relative weight of this dynamic process to the whole uh, erosion pattern. Even in the cell, we have some colleagues that did some measurements uh, more to the east uh, in, in Niger and other colleagues in, in Senegal. And, and you clearly see that more to the east, uh you still have you have much higher winds uh due to the low level jet in the dry season so you have significant wind much more wind erosion in the dry season more to the east of niger and on the opposite if we look at senegal you have almost no convection so no dust emission or local erosion in the wet season and most of the wind erosion is due to the dry season and to the low level jet so it really depends on the. It really depends on the on the. I mean, the, even in the cell, it's not an homogeneous pattern, mm. and and the relative weight of the different process can change. And I'm sure that if you go to the Sahara, uh, once again, depending on the place, uh, the relative weight of these dynamic uh, parameters would differ. Oh, makes sense. Yeah. I guess the final question from Paul is he's uh, asking about the threshold uh, threshold of wind erosion. It seems like you have you uh, made uh, some assumptions. Uh, apparently, a use in a value of six meters per second is that. Can you can you? Uh, come yeah, well, I, I just realized that depending on the paper and depending on the time, <laughs> the threshold may be the, may not be the same. For the very the first paper we produced. Uh, we mainly analyzed uh, daily average, and then we use, I think, a threshold of six meter per second, something like that. If I remember, yeah, that's six. Uh, but then when we worked on the dust uplift potential and using the five minute uh, measurements, we use a threshold that was derived from in situ measurements, and it was uh, uh, close to seven uh, meter per second for this specific location. So all the computation we, we made with the dust uplift potential was based on a threshold derived from, well, derived from in situ measurements and it's about seven meter per second. But it also depends on the eight of the measurements. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so he, here, uh, somebody uh, is asking if you could leave the slide with the uh, with the website uh, where to download. Oh yes, data. yeah. This, somebody is asking. So in the meantime, I have one more question. Just uh, uh, I will make a like a, just a comment here. The the both the recording and the presentation will be available on the website in a few days. Um, and well, I hope that if you simply uh, put Indaf on a, any motor, you would find our page. <laughs> <laughs> yes, as well. Uh, I, th I think I have uh, three general questions. I mean, I, this is just uh, uh, more about, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't particularly focus on this area. So uh, to me, uh, some maybe these questions may sound like uh, obvious. Uh, so I wonder, in all these years you have been observing the Sahel, have you noticed uh, any uh, whether the dust activity can be uh, associated with any uh, changes in uh, anthropogenic activity, uh, land use, or what, whatever, uh, in all these years you've been there observing the area? With this monitoring, because we only monitor, I would say, the ambient concentration, uh, we have not been able to make a direct link between concentration and, I would say, land use. Mm -hmm. uh, we we know from uh, in situ uh, erosion flux measurement that there is a clear influence of of land use on the 
okay. on the erosion fluxes and on the dust emission. But this is uh, this is not with these kind of measurements that we really detect uh, the influence of the land use, which is huge on the wind erosion uh, fluxes, or saltation fluxes. Right, yeah. We have different sites with uh, uh, BSNA samplers uh, in on sites cultivated in mill. Recently, our colleague Caroline uh, Pierre instrumented some site, and Jean-Louis Rajou, in uh, Senegal or on... Um, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have the word for the, <laughs> for the cultivation. Um, well, we we try to instrument sites with different land use, and we clearly see that there is a change depending on what you cultivate, and also depending on what you are doing with the vegetation residue. Uh, traditionally, in Niger, part of the residue were, were left on the surface, and this protect the surface from the high winds of the season after. Uh, and now, more and more people just take all the residues, which really uh, leaves the surface bare and very prone to wind erosion. So there, there is uh, some uh, change that we can observe in the agricultural practice that really have an, an impact if you measure uh, the erosion flux. But when you simply measure concentration, you have the results of the dust produced over the, a big area. It can be cultivated, it can be fallow. Uh, you also have siren dust transport in addition. So it, it's really not... Uh, I would say easy. I, I should. <laughs> I wanted to say possible, but I hope that it will be it will be possible if we have longer time series to really separ separate the influence of the of the climate and the, and the land use change. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that, that that's true. <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, the I was wondering how do you do you control or do you have any way to con um, look into the presence of smoke and dust mixed with smoke. Yes, you're right. We don't control. <laughs> uh, we only measure uh, the PM10 concentration. Mm -hmm. We have, a, um, I would say, um, an old version of this uh, instrument called the TEOM. Uh, so in, and we have a sampling system where it's warm up to 50 degrees. So we lose most of the volatile mm -hmm. compounds. So this can leave uh, carbon aqueous aerosol, but from the intensive measurements we made uh, during AMA, uh, in terms of mass uh, for the events we have been able to, to measure with biomass burning, it does not significantly impact the mass concentration, especially for PM10. Uh, another point is that we have some uh, sun photometer. So if you look at the angstrom coefficient, which is the dependence of the optical depth with wavelengths, you can detect the presence of biomass burning. And then you can exclude situation where you have biomass burning that dominates uh, the aerosol load. But the measurements by itself does not allow to make the separation. You have to make it. And you have some information, additional information from the photometer that can help you to make it. Right. Yeah, I guess I guess my comment was related more to some studies that are uh, are coming on becoming more more more, uh, more recent studies where they are focusing on the fact that uh, a lot of dust transport includes uh, uh, biomass burning material and you know that has some implications regarding uh, nutrition and and it, and from the viewpoint of remote sensing, which is what I pay attention to, that that mixture is really difficult to. Uh, detect as as dust or smoke. I mean, it's just a mix. We see it as a mixture, but it's difficult to tell. So I wonder, you know, yeah, whether from yeah, the it's, you can, yeah, yeah, it's also a matter of uh, of location. Uh, so we are in quite remote places, so we don't have a big uh, urban areas uh, that can be sources of biomass burning in Africa. It's uh, oh. even uh, domestic use. Uh, use also biomass i would say and it's uh, and because uh, we are in region where precipitation is low it's not so traditional to burn uh, the fields uh, before cultivation mm. so we are a little bit north to the Sahelian region where it's very common to uh, burn uh, the savanna or the fields before cultivation and also during the trade season in particular we we not the, the flow is uh, in the opposite direction 
than the biomass burning contrib contribution. I see. Okay, oh, that's good. Okay, I'm sorry for taking so much time. Uh, I don't see any. <laughs> oh, other for me, it's yeah. great. <laughs> yeah, you know, no, that super I, I'm wondering if there if there are more questions from uh, from um, from the attendance. So here I see one question, one additional question from. Angel Marshev, I hope I'm pronouncing correctly. Um, do you find some correlation link uh, between when ex exit within dust deposition, dust concentration, deep combustion, accumulated precipitation, and when you do not have wet deposition with accumulated precipitation? It's a little bit a complex um, question. Uh, I'm going to summarize like what are the correlations or links you have you get between dust within wet deposition, dust concentration, and deep convection. In fact, you showed a few slides about that. So perhaps, you know, he, like Angel is asking for a kind of a synthesis of that, if we can provide like a kind of a, perhaps repeat some uh, of it. Yes, I'm not, I don't know. I don't know if this one is the one. Uh, yeah, I think that was answer the, the question. So. I, I'm not sure I get the question right, but yeah, convective uh, events are, are responsible for most of the wet deposition, yes. But the point is that they are also responsible of the high dust concentration that you are washing out. Yeah. So the, 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 the difficult <laughs> aspect is really to be able to make a, a, a kind of budget. When you have a convective system, you emit a lot of dust and you wash out a lot of dust. So how <laughs> You can you can have a, a kind of null budget, yeah, just emit and and wash out. So that that's really not remarkable. A... Yeah, this is really remarkable. This this plot is really really very nice because you you see like the the peak in the PM10 that that is before the peak of the wind speed because like you have the precipitation popping in. So that that's really really very uh, very clear. Like uh, it's a it's a very nice uh, result, definitely. Yeah, and, but very difficult from a modeling point of view. Yeah, well, this is what I'm saying. And it, this is my questions were, I mean, I think that there, there, I mean, there, there are clear diagnostics that have shown here that are really uh that can be very helpful in um in in you know, like this is an average behavior during these convective events, you know, statistically yeah. speaking. And you know, one of the problems that models have is um um, you know, representing a precise, you know, like an event, right? Because it's stochastic. I mean, there's mm -hmm. a lot of like random uncertainty and, you know, so, but if you are able to run like simulations and have a statistical representation of your convective events, these kind of constraints are very interesting to see if your model is going in the right direction, right? Because you, I mean, this is a kind of a statistical average behavior, what happens uh, in that station with convection wind and concentration so i think this is a very strong constraint for models so very cool no, no, um, yeah i i agree that the statistical significance is important because i don't think it's really realistic to imagine that you could simulate correctly each convective events crossing the cell and the right concentration at the right time and so on so yes having a kind of statistical uh Representation of the kind of convective event, how much dust you can have before, after. No, I, I agree that it's more relevant for modeling that uh, imagining that you will simulate everything in detail. Yeah, well, at least for climate models, you have like uh, parameterizations that are more simple. Or yeah, yeah. Um, so in in that in that respect, I have a few questions. Maybe it's a little late. Um, um, uh, so I just. May may make a a question on the uh, okay. There's a question of Paul. I prefer like that the systems make their questions. So Paul, do you think uh, that mineralogy could be more or less inferred from your chemical analysis? You seem to have detected major inorganic ions. Are you doing mineralogical analysis of your? You were saying that you are doing some analysis of size of your deposition um, and of uh, nutrients. Are you planning to do some mineralogy? Um, so this is a uh, yeah this this is a on ongoing project. So what we are trying to do is to analyze the and also the second point is the size distribution in the deposition samples, uh, which will not give you a direct link with the size distribution in the air because it's collected with water. 
So to make the analyze, we decided to uh, disperse as much as possible. And considering the fact that at least the coarse particles, if they are still in this distribution, they were in the air. So this gives you a kind of uh, minimum amount of coarse particles you should have in the air to produce such deposition. So I, and I think once again, in terms of uh, modeling of the dust cycle, this could really bring some information. Yeah. Uh, for the deposition, uh, what we have is uh, uh, elementary composition in uh, aerosols and in deposition, uh, and some uh, esti some measurements of the nutrients, and for some sample uh, carbon and uh, um, nitrogen. Uh, but this was on a short duration program. Uh, we made this sampling during two years. Uh, one of the sampling stations was in Niger, so remotely. So we sampled the material, asked the people to do it. So the so number of cases where we are really able to have the full um, data set on aerosol composition, uh, deposition composition for both the insoluble and the soluble fraction are not so numerous, but that's what we are going to produce, okay. and uh, but no mineralogical analysis. Sorry, okay. elementary. We have elementary composition, so you can make some links between some ratio between elements uh, with uh, with mineralogical composition. So it's okay. not the same, but it's a way to to make the link. Okay, uh, well, I think we could be here like for for an, uh, another hour. Um, it's uh, yeah, maybe we can do that. Yeah, I would be, I would be glad. Point, uh, time. <laughs> um, so, but uh, um, we'll try to keep the you know the time uh, because people have other commitments. So, Beatrice, I mean, I, I I it was very very nice to have you here. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I hope that we can discuss further. Um, this data set is incredibly valuable. Um, you know, I, I hope we can all use it more in the future. Um, it's uh, particularly not only the data set, but the type of analysis that you're doing in your papers that can be really helpful to constrain uh, aspects of the model. So uh, with this, um, I'm going to close. Um, and again, thank you, Beatrice. And thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, we'll see you in the next webinar. And you will have the presentation online soon. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much for Bye -bye. the invitation. It was a great time. Thank you, Beatrice.